fakeware and cookware information about uh, tonight about our new study that's come out and our Ecology Center Live series. Um, we are very happy to have you here with us today and we're happy to be joined by a couple of our terrific Healthy Stuff staff um, that are going to be able to talk about this report. Uh, a few housekeeping things before uh, we launch right into the presentation. Um, we are going to, I guess I should introduce myself. Sorry about that. My name is Rebecca Munich. I am the Deputy Director of the Ecology Center. I work with our wonderful speakers tonight and our environmental health team um, on our various Healthy Stuff projects. Um, this program is uh, scheduled to last until six o'clock, so we'll hear a presentation and then we'll have some time for question and answers. Uh, currently, all of our listeners are in listen-only mode. If at any time during the webinar you have a question, please do use the chat box to share it with us. So after our presentation from Jillian Miller and Melissa Sargent today, again, we're going to have plenty of time for questions, but if you get them in the queue right away via the chat box or the Q&A um, feature, we'll make sure we have time to answer them. Um, so for today's webinar, we are recording all of the material and the materials will be available tomorrow, including the recording um, and the slides. So uh, I just wanted to let folks know that this is part of Ecology Center's work related to our Healthy Stuff project, and in particular, the testing that we've recently done on cookware and bakeware pans, looking for toxic PFAS chemicals in them. And I'm gonna ask Laura for you uh, to switch so that I can share my screen now. All right, give me a moment. Okay. All right, can folks see my screen? Yes. Okay, the slides. Okay. Um, let me present this. Okay. Um, so again, this is our cookware and bakeware report looking at healthier choices that we can make there. Before I introduce our speakers today, I want to introduce our Healthy Stuff project and the work that we do to protect people from toxic chemicals in everyday products. Um, so this is our Healthy Stuff team, or some of the team here, um, which was put together, gosh, over a decade ago. Um, in 2009, I believe it was, we launched Healthy Stuff, and we we're really one of the first um, organizations to test consumer products for toxic chemicals in them. Even before Healthy Stuff started, we were testing children's toys um, in 2006 through our HealthyToys.org project. Uh, we were the first NGO to independently test consumer products for lead and other heavy metals and publicize the results as a, as a part of this project. And as you might remember in 2007, there was a lot of action going on related to toxic chemicals and toys and things along those lines that eventually led to federal policy related to the Child, Children's Safe Products Improvement Act, which um, lowered the level of lead available or allowed, excuse me, at the federal level in children's products, as well as other chemicals like certain phthalates and things like that. But we knew we couldn't stop there, so we um, continued to work on uh, other product categories. Um, and in the next 10 years, um, we've done so much with our Healthy Stuff project. Um, we, in 2016, worked on public policy efforts with our partners across the United States to reform the Toxic Substances Control Act, which is the main law that governs toxic chemicals in the consumer products that we use every day. Um, and doing that, um, we were happy in 2016 that that law was revised and there's still work to be done. It was imperfect in its revision, as many things are, and so we'll continue to be testing products and working on state level policy to push federal policy for safer standards. Um, so what is healthy stuff? I've mentioned testing consumer products for toxic chemicals, but some of the things that are incredibly important that we do is we do that in a really fast way. Um, we use our spec different types of spectrographic equipment to look at the elements or the chemical compounds that are in consumer products, and we can do that quickly. We're lucky to have our staff with us who have expertise in that area. A lot of our campaigns um, also are connected with moving the marketplace towards safer and healthier alternatives. For example, 
um, when we test consumer products, we reach out to manufacturers and retailers to let them know about our results that we find and to work with them and encourage them to put in safer chemicals as a result of our test results and to swap out. Um, we also push them um, sometimes in a, if they're a bit of a laggard by consumer market campaigns um, launching and making sure that families are reaching out to these companies to let them know there's a desire and a need and a demand for safer products. Um, so in this way of helping the leaders move in the right direction and being able to make sure that we have the stick, stick option to move with any companies that are a little bit slower to move, we're able to have some really terrific impacts. So I wanna cover a few of those before I turn it over um, to our speakers today. So in the last 10 years, we have found that over um, our, tests, our testing and our uh, market campaigns have led to 100 million pounds less phthalates used annually and vinyl flooring as a result of our various campaigns and testing there. Um, knowing that over 2 billion food cans each year are now, um, you are now use, not using BPA, excuse me, um, and that tens of thousands of children's car seats are not using hazardous flame retardants. This is an area where the Ecology Center has been working for many years in our Healthy Stuff Lab to test children's car seats and to ensure that they don't contain toxic chemicals like hazardous flame retardants like PFAS um, that we're going to talk about more today in terms of cans, or pans, excuse me, um, and so on. So you can see the list goes on and on here. We have over 200,000 visitors each year to our website um, and a database of over $15,000, 15,000 products that we have tested over the last decade. Um, so we are seeing that in a larger side of things that my biomonitoring studies are showing um, more restricted or phased out chemicals, the levels of those and that work that we have contributed to restricting those, those levels are, are going down in the, in the U.S. population. Um, so that's some of the victories and impacts that we have had. Um, but I am a poor substitute for the folks who are going to speak to you today about our PANS report. Um, so I want to introduce briefly uh, Jillian Miller and Melissa Sargent. Apologies for the snafu. Melissa is this person here. Um, Jillian brings um, experience analyzing materials by a variety of spectrographic techniques in both academia and industry before coming to the Ecology Center in 2014. She's peer authored many peer-reviewed articles. She is such a wealth of knowledge for us to do rapid screening of consumer products for our healthy stuff. Um, testing, um, teaching interns and other state officials about how to use um, spectrographic equipment um, and techniques to actually look at what's inside these products that we have every day. Um, so she is interested in both the advocacy side of things that we work on our market campaigns with Healthy Stuff and really digging in and developing new scientific techniques that we can use to look at products um, and toxic chemicals in there. Melissa Cooper Sargent um, is, came to us from Local Motion Green in 2013, and she now works with our Healthy Stuff Project as both an educator and an excellent writer um, and communicator about all things toxic in the environment. Um, so Melissa is passionate about teaching community members about how to avoid toxic exposures and using things like the, our Healthy Stuff reports to push the marketplace in the right direction so that we have healthier and safer products available on store shelves um, and information in consumers' hands to be able to make better choices when that's possible. So I am going to turn it over at, to Melissa and Jillian to talk a little bit more about the study that came out yesterday, hot off the presses, um, on cookware and bakeware that has nonstick chemicals or not in them. Thank you, Becca. I'm Jillian Miller. And uh, on the next slide, we're going to uh, start off by telling you a little bit about uh, the challenges in the, in the last year before getting into some report details. Um, since the whole pandemic situation, we've had uh, somewhat limited access to our own lab, but the good news is we do have access to it. We just um, have to uh, use the sign-up sheet so that we don't overlap people working in 
in the office at the same time because our, our lab is a room in our main offices in Ann Arbor. Uh, in our lab, the Healthy Cell Lab, call it, we have two main uh, test instruments that we use. Um, one of them, uh, which was not used for the cookware study, but that we use a lot for other things, is called XRF or X-ray fluorescence. And technically it is um, a portable instrument. And so one of our team members tried to set up a sort of bedroom lab to do some testing at home. Apparently that was really challenging and I think he did give up on it after a while, but he tried <laughs> so as not to have to come to our official offices. Um, one, of the, one of the bigger limitations was um, we have not since March had access to the University of Michigan labs where we were using some equipment to try to develop newer methods uh, that could be really useful for our research into PFAS chemicals and products. Um, there were two different uh, labs on campus that have uh, different types of test equipment that we were essentially renting time on. Um, and that was, uh, that's really interesting work we hope to get back to eventually when we're allowed to go back. Uh, we appreciate our interns and work studies immensely in the Healthy Stuff team because there's a lot of, of, of work and time that goes into dealing with uh, samples when we're doing a project where we test a lot of products. So we really rely on our interns and with the current situation, our interns are not on campus, they're not coming to the office, and that makes a huge difference for us because we do give them a great deal of hands-on work in normal times. They do a lot of managing um, samples. They even sometimes go out and purchase products for us if it's a type of project where you can do that. Uh, they deal with inventory and labeling things and proper storage, and they also operate the test equipment. So without our, our robust team of interns, uh, everything is taking longer, and um, we look forward to having uh, a team of graduate and undergraduate students back again um, in the hopefully not too far future. Next slide. Becca mentioned the new report that just came out yesterday called What's Cooking? Uh, it focused on nonstick cooking and baking pans where we tested the coatings to find out if they were uh, the type of coatings made with PFAS chemicals. So we're going to tell you more about that. Next slide. The reason we chose nonstick pans as something to study was, uh, first of all, it's a question that we often get when talking about PFAS uh, with various audiences. Uh, people will often ask about, what about Teflon? I've heard that that's PFAS. Is it bad? Um, so we knew it was a product that, that people might be interested in, but it also fits into our broader mission of eliminating, eventually, non-essential uses of PFAS in products. Uh, there are a lot of products out there, um, and, and cookware is one. We hope to do some more projects like this. And the, to, to simplify all well, with that, it's basically to protect clean drinking water. There are other environmental issues as well with PFAS, but um, because of significant harm to human health, uh, and the extreme difficulty of cleaning up these chemicals from water, uh, drinking water is uh, a greatly at risk resource. Uh, one of the biggest uses of PFAS chemicals is to make fluoropolymers uh, like Teflon. And in our report, we use the term PTFE uh, because that is the general name for that polymer. Teflon is a brand name and uh, PTFE is the general name of the polymer polytetrafluoroethylene, um, if you're interested in the chemical name. So this is a polymer form of PFAS, um, and it is made from PFAS chemicals. You need other PFAS chemicals to make it. Uh, this polymer that is often seen on nonstick uh, cooking pans and baking pans has a lot of brand names because different formulations of are made by different companies. Uh, and I listed some of them here that turned up in our study, Teflon, is the one that people know. The others, most people don't really recognize. Uh, but Grublon, Granite Stone, Duraglide, Quantanium, those are all uh, various brand names from companies that are all, all represent PTFE. So from a chemical perspective, they're extremely uh, similar coatings. PTFE is made using several hazardous PFAS. Uh, one that you may have heard of is PFOA, P-F-O-A. 
Uh, this is a processing aid that's very important uh, to make the polymer PTFE. You can't really do without uh, a process aid. Since PFOA is so toxic and problematic and bioaccumulative um, and persistent, uh, the U.S. companies phased, phased it out, agreed to phase it out, and mostly replaced it uh, with um, a set of, of similar chemicals, which uh, the, the biggest name is Gen X, is a brand name for a process aid similar to PFOA. So that'll come up again uh, as we talk about our findings in this report. We did not test for these chemicals like PFOA and Gen X that potentially could be left in a, a, a coating on a pan. We tested only for the coating itself. What type of coating is this? Is it PTFE? Is it a different type of polymer, you know, different type of plastic coating or something else? Uh, next slide. Uh, we have a few slides on uh, background about PFAS, which I'll go through quickly. Uh, I think uh, many of you, especially living in Michigan, we've been hearing about PFAS in uh, contaminating water and soil for a while now. Uh, so really brief background, PFAS are, are often called forever chemicals because of their extreme persistence in the environment, at least of many, many of the PFAS chemicals. Uh, and some of the PFAS chemicals will change in the environment and break down to a certain degree, but only to the, to the point of becoming a real forever chemical. So it might break down into an extremely persistent PFAS chemical. Um, and there are, there are very strong chemical bonds in these uh, chemicals that are difficult for bacteria and other organisms to break down that would normally break down um, uh, chemicals that are in the environment. Uh, the, many PFAS chemicals also are soluble in water and tend to, and tend to travel long distances um, via water and they also travel through air. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, in the US, manufacturers stopped making PFOA, that process aid uh, for PTFE, uh, but uh, it is still made uh, in pretty large quantities overseas uh, in various locations. Uh, and then the replacements for PFOA, like Gen X, are turning up absolutely everywhere. Next slide. PFAS have PFAS chemicals uh, are, constitute thousands of individual chemicals, of which only a few of them have been studied in detail. Uh, but some that have been studied, um, particularly P PFOA that keeps coming up, is probably the best studied. Um, but Gen X is, is getting up there with uh, research on it, too. Um, there are strong links with certain PFAS to this whole uh, unfortunate looking list of health effects. Next slide. And for the moment we're living in now, I need to mention uh, researchers who um, are studying certain PFAS chemicals and effects on health and especially effects on the immune system have brought up concerns about exacerbating the effects possible, the possibility of exacerbating the effects of COVID-19. Uh, it's obviously still an early area of research, but there are reason to have some concerns about that, especially because certain PFAS chemicals are shown in earlier studies to suppress uh, immune functions. Um, and in some studies have shown a decreased response to vaccines, certain vaccines. Uh, that kind of effect has not been studied for uh, any of the new COVID vaccines, of course, because it's also new. Next slide. For our cookware and bakeware study, um, our uh, communications director, Erica Bertram, made this infographic after we had a, 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 a number of discussions about the life cycle of a nonstick coating and trying to help people understand what this coating on my pan represents. Why is this harmful? Um, so we tried to represent the life cycle from manufacture to disposal of a nonstick coating that is uh, PTFE or Teflon. Um, so over at the left, it starts with a, a factory that produces uh, some of the key chemicals that you need to make this, this type of coating. Uh, there can be air pollution, uh, wastewater dumping, um, and other pathways to get into both surface water and groundwater at that chemical manufacture stage. And moving along to the right, uh, you eventually have a PTFE coating applied at a factory. Uh, we have some examples of um, 
of uh, some contamination of environment there. Uh, next, you see an, a stove and an oven because there you're at the use phase. The consumer has a pan um, and the potential risks at that stage are not uh, are not 100% clear, but we do know that these coatings will emit um, hazardous chemicals if you heat the pan high enough. Uh, and there is not one agreed upon temperature, but generally in the range of four to 500 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you, you may start getting some off-gassing of chemicals from that coating, or you may even start having breakdown of the coating uh, chemistry itself. So you definitely don't want to overheat the, these nonstick pans. Uh, if you have them. And then as you move to the right, we get into disposal stage. So eventually uh, your nonstick coated pan is going to go in the trash and it's probably going to go in the trash uh, sooner than a, a, a an uncoated pan like a stainless steel or cast iron because coatings will eventually fail. Uh, there certainly are coatings that are, or, or I should say nonstick coated pans that are more expensive than others that are purposely made to be more durable. So there is a wide range in durability of nonstick PTFE pans. Uh, but still they eventually will peel or get scratched or, or, or chip depending on the type of coating. So they will eventually get landfilled or incinerated or in some places you can recycle cooking pans and baking pans. Um, all of those pathways have a number of issues and I would encourage you to read our report. We spent lots of time delving into, um, into this end of life stage and what do each of those pathways mean? Uh, are there issues with landfilling? What about incinerating? A, a pan that has a, a PTFE coating. What happens to that coating? Does it actually destroy uh, the, you know, the PFAS nature of that or not? So um, I uh, would encourage you to take a look at our report. Next slide. As part of this report, we, we had some help from a, um, our colleagues at Material Research. Uh, who are consultants with a lot of expertise in investigating supply chains and manufacturers and where products go along the, the manufacturing path. Uh, they helped us um, get some really specific information about two of the products we tested, uh, not because they're the worst products or anything like that, but just because uh, they both had PTFE coatings and they uh, and the, our consultants were able to find some information about their supply chains. So I've highlighted just one of those here. There's a lot more detail uh, in our report. Uh, one of the case studies involves a muffin pan that we tested um, from a company called G&S. They advertise making their pans in the United States. Uh, and this is the general uh, chain that we found, uh, starting with the production of the process aid that you need to make PTFE. There are, of course, upstream processes um, uh, before this, uh, but this is where we started. Um, and this chain of events all happens in the United States. So uh, somehow all the numbers got turned to one, but think of them as one, two, three on this slide. Uh, in North Carolina, the process aid uh, called Gen X is made. Kimors is a spinoff of DuPont. Kimors now took all of DuPont's fluorochemicals business. Uh, and Keymores owns all that. So when you hear, hear Keymores, think used to be DuPont. <laughs> uh, so they make Gen X, this process aid. Uh, this area, Fayetteville, North Carolina, has had really serious problems with uh, contamination of the surrounding uh, waters and soil. Uh, there's contamination in the Cape Fear River that supplies lots of people with drinking water. And because the Keymores plant um, uh, emits, emits uh, some of its emission uh, emits um, gases out of its stacks. Uh, there was Gen X coming out of its stacks as well, and that was eventually that uh, was going into the air and then eventually coming down with precipitation. So basically, raining uh, these chemicals. The Gen X made in North Carolina is shipped to West Virginia. Uh, Parkersburg is the town. Uh, Key Morris has a plant there called Washington Works. This is an old plant that makes fluoropolymers and other products for Keymores. Uh, the Gen X is used as one of the key ingredients in making PTFE or Teflon. And I can write Teflon here because that's Keymores brand. So, so, that, so it is called Teflon. So they make what's called a dispersion of Teflon. It's kind of in a liquid form at that point. Uh, and then they sell that to other companies. Uh, in this area in West Virginia, there's been a very long history of uh, 
really awful water contamination as well as poisonings of of livestock and uh, this is the this is uh, covered in a, a documentary that you might have heard of called the devil we know um, it used to be PFOA was one of the major contaminants there and now it's now it's Gen X unfortunately in the same uh, areas that had people's well water contaminated in the past with PFOA now have Gen X and the Teflon is shipped to Connecticut where GNS the company that makes pan has a plant and they spray this Teflon onto uh, steel uh, and eventually later that steel is stamped into pans such as the muffin pan that we tested uh, this Connecticut plant of GNS, uh, we didn't find any information about PFAS chemicals that may be emitted because those just aren't being monitored uh, at this time. Uh, but that plant has had uh, violations of the Clean Water Act for other chemicals. Next slide. So backing up a little bit about the testing we did, uh, there's a picture here of a pan uh, maybe you can see there's an area scraped off of the coating. It looks like someone was rubbing it with something abrasive. Uh, so we scrape off uh, some of the coating uh, with a metal tool and put those pieces onto the stage of our FTIR spectrometer, one of our uh, key instruments. Uh, we collect the data and identify the coating composition. There's a small picture in the corner of, the, of that um, spectrometer, also called an infrared spectrometer. Next slide. We tested 14 cooking pans, 10 baking pans. We chose the pans uh, to have a range of prices. All of them either said that they were nonstick or a couple of the baking pans didn't actually say nonstick, but they looked like they had coatings. So we included them. Uh, and there's a full list of products uh, with details about retailers, where we bought them, et cetera, that's in our report. Next slide. Here's an overview of test results. 79% uh, of the cooking pans that we tested were PTFE coated um, and 20% of the baking pans. Um, and we also uh, found that the product claims on some of the packaging uh, could be confusing and might mislead people. And we're gonna hear a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, another finding that uh, somewhat surprised us was a couple of pans that had BPA-based epoxy coatings, and that is the same material that's on the insides of some food cans that we worked on, on a, a few years ago in a project on food cans. Uh, we could find very little research about BPA-based coatings on cookware and bakeware in the scientific literature, uh, but there seems to be reason for concern since, of course, you're these are contacting food and or heating them. So uh, there is certainly a potential for migration of any residual BPA into food, but there wasn't much research on that. So we are calling for more investigation uh, into that. Uh, there's a, the picture here is one of the um, two baking pans. This is a pizza pan uh, from Cooking Concepts that we found to be coated with BPA-based epoxy. Uh, these were, these were um, particularly inexpensive pans and that might be connected we would need to do a little more investigation. Next slide. Uh, this is one of the infographics prepared for our report uh, highlighting the uh, cooking pans finding that the pretty large majority were of non-stick cooking pans did have a PTFE coating. Next slide. Um, and this is just, this is a little bit more technical, but uh, for those who are curious, an overview of the coating types we found, because there are other coatings other than PTFE. I mentioned the BPA-based epoxy was on a couple. Uh, then on baking pans, it's actually very common. We found to have a silicone-based uh, polymer coating. And uh, there's a little bit more detail in the report about that and what we know about any, any you know, possible chemical migration problems from that. Um, the, the pans that were labeled ceramic coated, which you, you probably have seen if you've looked at <laughs> frying pans in the last few years at all, um, they, did, they did stand up to the claims, it seemed. Uh, pans were coated with silicon dioxide, which can be considered a ceramic. Uh, so uh, those did not appear to have any PTFE. And uh, so those are probably a better choice, although they also probably are not known for lasting um, all that long. Next slide. 
I'm going to turn it over to Melissa, who's going to start with uh, some of our findings on those uh, the packaging and how it's dip why is it, why and how it's difficult to uh, determine what sort of coating is on a pan. Thanks, Jillian. And just remember to put your uh, questions in the chat, uh, and Jillian will come back to you at the end. Okay. Go ahead, Melissa. Go. Oh, okay. Um, all right, so here we have a picture of one of the pans and um, it can be very confusing for consumers whether you are in the store or you're shopping online. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about shopping online also. Um, but companies are happy to tell you about all the things that are not in their product. Um, I think hopefully we've all learned um, from BPA free, seeing that on labels that we we now know that that doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe because it could still have uh, a very similar chemical uh, bisphenol S, uh, so uh, BPS. So I always feel like, okay, beware if they're not telling you what's in their product, if they're only telling you what's not in their product. Um, so we did find that on the labels of um, the pans that we purchased, if it says PFOA free, that didn't necessarily mean PTFE free. So PFOA free did not mean PFOS free. Um, so like this one here, it has a lot of great um, things that it's saying, uh, promoting about the pan, but um, it did indeed have uh, PTFE in it. Uh, next slide, please. And so when you're shopping on Amazon or some other um, third party, uh, uh, online site. This one was very odd and very interesting and, and this was the reason why we purchased it. Uh, on Amazon it had all sorts of descriptions and questions. Have you tasted the flavor of nature? Eco-friendly stone granite coating and all a lot of claims on Amazon. Now when we received the product in the mail it um, it did not it did not have the same uh, claims. It didn't have the same listing on the product itself. And, uh, but when we tested it, it turned out to be PTFE, um, the same chemical that's used to make Teflon. So uh, that one was definitely too good to be true. Uh, next slide, please. So we came up with um, this rating system. Um, that's something that is, can be challenging for us. And uh, people generally do want us to create a rating system when we have uh, test results. And um, so our preferred options would just be a, an uncoated pan. So stainless steel, cast iron, glass. We know that this is a durable pan that can be passed on for generations. It's going to last a long time. You can avoid the whole toxic life cycle, life cycle of PTFE. You, it won't have BPA on it. Um, and it might cost more upfront. Uh, maybe you can't find one for less than $10, but again, it's gonna last a long time. And um, you might find them at estate sales or thrift stores. So you can still find good quality pans out there. Um, caution, we have that category as coated pans. Um, so silicone and enamel. And um, we now ceramic is not listed on there. Um, ceramic coated pans, we did not have caution with that regarding the toxicity of it. We did not look into that, but um, it is still a coated pan, so the, the problem with the ceramic coated pan is just that it, it might not last as long because once it starts getting scratched and chipped, um, the, the lifespan of the pan is not as long. Um, and then again, of course, avoid PTFE coated pans uh, if possible. Next slide, please. Uh, so people want to know, well, how, do you, how can you cook eggs. It seems like there's a lot of concern about cooking eggs without a Teflon pan or a nonstick pan. So uh, Jillian reached out to a lot of um, chefs and uh, was able to, to get in touch with Josh Hirschkovitz, uh, chef and proprietor at Hirsch's in Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, this is what he said. He says, if your cast iron is seasoned properly, you can use it almost as thoughtlessly as a Teflon or simil similarly coated pan. Uh, make sure the pan is heated to where you want and then add a bit of fat such as butter or oil and then uh, slide the egg in. And he personally uses uh, ceramic coated nonstick pans. So um, we were happy to have uh, a professional input on that. Next slide, please. Uh, and so 
as consumers, we want to do the right thing. Um, we want to try to find a pan that's PTFE free. It's really hard. Um, but so, but if you see PTFE free on the label, then it likely does not contain PFAS. Otherwise, you cannot really be sure. Um, and you can't just tell just by the touch or the feel or the look. And so we, there were two pans um, that we tested that were labeled PTFE free, uh, and they were um, ceramic coated pans. So the Goodful Titanium Ceramic and the Cuisinart Green Gourmet. And um, the labels, besides saying PTFE free, the labels also uh, said that they were ceramic. And uh, our testing did show that they were indeed ceramic. So that bodes well for other pans that are ceramic coated. Um, you know, we can't say for sure, but that's, we can't test every product that's out there. Um, so, you know, we try to, um, people have to sometimes just go up based on, you know, what we've learned through our, our research and studies here. Next slide, please. Um, so ceramic can offer a relatively nonstick surface. Um, if it's, we're talking about a ceramic nonstick coating without the toxic chemical load, like I mentioned, um, known for having short useful lifespans. And, um, but then there's also fully ceramic pans that might be um, more common as baking pans, such as muffin pans, casserole dishes, loaf pans, and even baking sheets. And um, yes, thank you. <laughs> so for making more informed purchases, so if you have a PTFE coated nonstick pan, um, you can still use them. As Jillian mentioned, we have not found a, lo a lot of research showing that they are going to cause a problem during use unless it gets to high heat. Um, so you, you want to be careful not to put it on um, high heat over 400 or 500 degrees. Um, for cooking pans, consider the cast iron, uh, stainless steel, or other durable alternatives. And glass is still great for baking. Um, there are cast iron options for baking also, and of course, um, ceramics. So when your uh, coated pan gives out and you're looking to replace it, these are things that you can look for. Um, and just be, be wary as consumers. Um, I always tell people, read the fine print, flip that product over, try to read the backside of the label, see how much information you can pull um, just from the label. And if it's just telling you PFOA free, it's, it's being a little cagey there. It's not really telling you what it is. It does not necessarily mean PFOS free. So it's hard to trust. Um, uh, so beware of those kind of marketing claims. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have um, PFOS is, of course, not only in pans, it's in a lot of other products. And um, so there are some campaigns out there. Uh, some of our partners at um, Mind the Store campaign, uh, we have a campaign to tell McDonald's to get PFOS out of the food packaging that's been um, found in their wrappers. Um, Green Science Policy Institute has a list of PFOS free products when you're um, shopping for other things. So. Uh, of course, we can still find PFOS just basically in a spray can. You can get waterproof sprays or stain proofing sprays um, at the store. So that's just bringing PFOS right into your home. And we would uh, discourage people from using those products on their um, trying to waterproof their boots or shoes or clothing or furniture. Um, if you're spraying that in your home or just uh, you know, near your, your own body, the spray droplets could be harmful. There's been multiple cases of um, studies of acute lung disease following waterproofing spray use that can be found in the medical literature. So we would highly discourage folks from, from the DIY kind of waterproofing. Um, of course, the PFOS is used, uh, you can find clothing that already has it on there. Now you're not going to have the, the danger of applying it yourself, but then you're still uh, unfortunately, contributing to the whole life cycle of PFAS during the production stage and the disposal stage. So um, it can be on clothing, carpet, camping gear, tents. It's really hard to even find a tent that doesn't have uh, PFAS on it these days. Uh, ski waxes and automotive waxes. Um, PFAS-based waxes can shed hazardous chemicals into the environment, um, like snowboarding on, and skiing. It can get down into, um, into the snow and into the water that way. But luckily, um, there's more and more alternatives out there. Um, there's non-PFOS waxes available. Next slide, please. 
And we didn't go too heavily into um, some of the alternatives for these other um, products, but, but they are out there. Um, so as I mentioned, um, this is just kind of another list of, of what I've just mentioned. Um, but it's, you know, it's also in paints and cosmetics and some cleaning products. So um, this is, you know, this is why we're doing this work. It's very ubiquitous. Um, the pollution is also very ubiquitous. As you could see earlier, um, you know, we've had a lot of uh, problems in Michigan and Rockford, Michigan with um, the World Wolverine Worldwide Shoe and um, the water pollution that's happening there. And, and it's recently been found in Detroit, in Dearborn, it's in Ann Arbor. And uh, as Jillian illustrated, it's um, you know, in other parts of the country, in North Carolina and Alabama as well. So uh, we, we do have a lot of concern. We try to avoid, um, try to get the word out about how we can avoid it uh, whenever possible. Next slide, please. And I think that we might be towards the end here. Yes. So, yes. We have some terrific questions that have come in. And so I'm going to go and put those both to you, Melissa and Jillian. Um, and I'm going to try to group a few together that are similar. Um, we have some questions about specific products. And so maybe if you tested these, you can let us know um, if there are any results in them. Um, one is the Stone Earth Pans from Ozeri, I believe they are, which claim to be free of APEO, Gen X, PFOS, PFOA, PFBS. And then another one that was another brand, um, in case we tested this, was Scan Pan. Um, that's a stick-free pan um, said to be made of patented ceramic titanium surface. Um, so I wondered if you knew anything about those particular pans. And thanks for the questions um, from Judith and uh, I forget, Megan, who asked this. Uh, we did not test scan pan. Uh, based on the pans that claim ceramic that we did test, I think there's a good chance that one probably is what it says it is. Um, can't know for sure without testing it, of course, um, but that's promising. And um, Ozeri, uh, Stone Earth, we did test that. That is PTFE coded. Um, I believe when we got that pan, it had a little sticker inside that said Greblon C3. Did some Googling on that. It was hard to find, but eventually we found indications that it was PTFE, but of course our testing showed that it was. So that's a good example. Uh, we highlighted that one in our report, the Stone Earth Pan, partly because, I mean, it's called Stone Earth, kind of implying something about stone. Uh, it's made with a speckled look, uh, like they purposely speckled the polymer coating to make it look sort of like an enamel. And it makes a whole list of claims, like it's free of all these different chemicals, which is great. And those claims might be completely true. It, it, it probably is free of those chemicals that are listed. But you'll notice it does not say PTFE free, nor does it say PFAS, you know, the, the general term PFAS. It doesn't say PFAS free either. And it's not, it's PTFE uh, like the others. Another question in a similar vein was the uh, Dynamo Tech Nonstick Diamond Infused Ceramic Pan? Ooh, we tested something that said diamond infused, but it was called Granite Stone Diamond. Uh, and the name that you said, I'm not seeing this in the chat, but uh, I think you it's in the said a name that, oh, q and oh, I'm looking in the chat. Okay, two places. Diamo Tech. Okay, so I'm not familiar with that brand name. Uh, it says diamond infused ceramic. This one says PTFE free. Uh, so I would guess that this is probably a silicon dioxide coating like the ones that we tested that said ceramic. Um, I cannot know without actually testing it. I think the fact that it says PTFE free is a good sign because if that's true, um, then there should be no Teflon PTFE coating. Um, and it's yeah, probably similar to the other uh, ceramics. And as we mentioned, we, we didn't um, have the capacity to delve really deeply into um, ceramic coatings, like how they're made, um, what goes into making those. We didn't gather that information. So we right now are saying that ceramic coated uh, for nonstick is probably a much better choice than Teflon or PTFE. Uh, but we still have a little a little caution on it um, or caveat on it saying, hey, these these sometimes don't last very long and therefore can, can be more wasteful. Um, and we don't have a lot of information about the coding. Great. 
A couple of other folks asked um, about the anodized aluminum pans. Um, and there's various brands that fall in there. If you know anything about those, it seems like these are different product categories. Um, perhaps, perhaps not. And then also the silicone baking pans for bread and brownies and muffins, like this, the flexible pans. So if you could speak to those options. Sure. Um, hard anodized aluminum. So that's, I don't know a great deal about it, but that term refers to um, the metal itself. Uh, and kind of a, a, it's not like a coating on the metal. Uh, it's like a way of making a natural oxide form on the metal, which is not an issue. Uh, if it, it, a pan can be anodized aluminum, aluminum and can also be coated, in which case you should pay attention to what, if anything, it says about the coating. If it says nonstick coating, then okay, that might be PTFE put on this aluminum pan, but the anodized itself doesn't indicate anything about a coating um, it's just about the metal surface. Um, so again, I would look at what else it says, if it says a, 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 anything about coating. Uh, and the, oh yeah, so the flexible silicone, um, I, we didn't research those for this report. I mean, I can tell you my general impression of those. Um, I don't like them because they get sticky. I had some once a long time ago. I was given some when they first came out. Um, and I found that they became sticky, like with something I couldn't get off. So really annoying. That was my personal experience with them. Um, so that is not a coating on a metal pan. That is like a completely plastic pan. Plastic just I'm using to mean a polymer. So it's a silicone polymer, um, polydimethyl siloxane for any chemistry oriented people. Um, I would be, I'm a little bit suspicious of those. Heating those up, you, they're, there's definite potential for some chemical migration from that. And I don't have any idea what, if that's like a health issue for people, but there's some research on silicone, silicone uh, parchment paper and those flexible silicone things that did find some migration of, of uh, silicone related chemicals into food. A couple of questions about the study here. Um, did we quantify uh, the amount of PTF E found in the coatings or just determine whether or not it was there? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. The, the infrared spectroscopy that we do does not, is not a quantitative method. Uh, we can, we can roughly, uh, if we look at a lot of products, we can, I mean, and if we look at a lot of data, we can get an idea of, of what we're seeing, uh, but we don't give numbers. So, uh, but I, I know from, because I know from looking at all these many, many uh, spectra, the data collected from all these coatings, that the, the cooking pans are uh, primarily PTFE when we see that. Um, like I can tell that it's not mixed with very much else. I, I mean, I think they, they probably, they, I'm sure they have some small amounts of various additives that I don't know about because all polymers do, but I can tell from the data that those are largely PTFE. The baking pans, that's not true. The PTFE on the baking pans is mixed with other polymers. And we did roughly categorize those. And there are some details in the report, but we didn't uh, go deep into, into that. So I can't tell you the percentage, like on the baking pans that also have polyether sulfone, another polymer. I can't tell you the exact percentage of each of those, but it's significant for both of them. Great. Um, another question related to pans, and then we have a couple of questions on other product categories that I want to touch on, um, is really important when we think of uh, the life cycle of these products is, do we have any recommendations for how to dispose of Teflon uh, pans and such? I think landfilling is the safest at this time. If you recycle so them. So don't put those in the recycle bin. No, I, there are, yeah, and in, uh, in the town I live in, which is Ann Arbor, you're not supposed to put those in the recycle. Um, we did look that up, but there, we also found out that there are some uh, municipalities that do accept uh, cooking pans in recycling either at a drop off or uh, even in curbside. Um, but we don't, we are pretty wary of that after looking into what, what happens with recycling metals because any plastic stuff or coatings that it's on metal is, is going to get burned off in an oven. And uh, we really don't know if that's going to destroy uh, PTFE coatings or if it's just going to
blow out their stacks as really nasty chemicals from the breakdown or itself. And so um, I, I think landfilling is probably the best option for now. That leads me to, when we think about the heat side of things, we know that temperature is problematic in Teflon pans if you overheat them in terms of you know health and human health and household and pets and things like that. How do you actually, do you know how you would actually tell if there is a temperature or some sort of physical indicator that your pan, uh, if you have a Teflon pan is overheating? I'm afraid there's not. Um, you're probably not going to smell anything if you were to overheat it to the point of causing it to volatilize something. <laughs> I don't think you're going to know. Um, and yeah, unless you can measure, I don't know, unless you're measuring the temperature of the food that's in the pan. <laughs> um, but certainly on a stovetop, uh, you wouldn't want to probably use it on high heat for anything. I don't know Sorry, the exact know number, but I think the it's the right high answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the high 400s or 500 degrees. Um, but that's difficult unless you have sort of an instant read thermometer for a stovetop pan. Obviously, you would know what the temperature in your oven would be um, if you're still using a Teflon pan before you go out and um, dispose of that and buy a new one. Um, and usually there is information. Right. I just don't know the number off the top of my head. Yeah, well, I mean, we gave, like, we found different numbers. There, there's not agreement on that. But yeah, four to 500 degrees Fahrenheit, you'd want to keep as your limit. So I guess I should have specified on the, on the stove top, it may be more difficult in the oven. Um, hopefully, you can just rely on your oven temperature that you set it. So a couple of other product categories came up. And one is, do car waxes used in car washes contain PFAS was one of the questions. Very possible. Yes. Also, the... A number of sites in Michigan were are potential sites related to car washes. As far as I know, that MPART or Michigan PFAS Action Response Team have looked at. You know, it's, it's also in the windshield protectors. Like, if there's a it, like the stuff that can be put on the windshield to make like the, the water rain up and stuff. Yeah, Rainex. That's PFAS. Another question that came up is um, wondering how you could identify PFAS in cosmetics. I'm mean, wondering if you have a couple of examples of, of products or types of products that would contain PFAS. I'm happy to chime in on that too. Uh, I would I'll, let one in, I'll let someone else take that. Uh, just what comes to mind for me is probably like a waterproof mascara or something where they're trying to, you know, have it be waterproof. Yeah, and I think uh, the same would go for sunscreens. Some of your waterproof sunscreens that are not, you know, mineral based that stick, stick around on your body because of the, they're, you know, usually stickier, um, have, can, have been found to contain PFAS. Now, that's not entirely certain that all of those would be, but those are some. And uh, I know a number of states are considering policy and we'll be working on that and pushing um, for our representatives here in Michigan to have policies related to eliminating and banning the use of PFAS chemicals in cosmetics. Um, so hopefully we'll see some more movement on that. Um, I'm just gonna scan through the other questions here. Um, this is a good one, uh, maybe the one to wrap up on here. Um, given all these harms of P uh, PTFE and other PFAS, do we ever foresee um, it being outlawed? Rebecca, you work mostly on the policy, so maybe you, you can address that one. <laughs> okay, I think we will we will see certain um, product categories uh, move away in at the state level first. Um, we've seen some action already on firefighting foams in a number of different states. In Michigan here, we have a take back program for, for firefighting foams that contain PFAS. Um, there's movement on food contact materials and state policies. And there's uh, our own Debbie Dingle has introduced a bill at the federal level. Um, she's right here from uh, represents Ann Arbor on PFAS and food contact materials and food wrapping and such. So I think it's going to be product category by product category rather than chemical, which is a little different than the chemicals that are actually uh, addressed through drinking water standards and things along those lines. Um, so, so I do think that we'll have more restrictions. I think it's going to be a slow process. 
um, at the federal level to get those. It always is. The states are more nimble and can move quickly and companies can move even faster than states can to move out of these toxic chemicals. So with that, I want to um, thank everyone for coming. Um, we're able to provide this information and provide these studies because of support from folks like you. So we wanna offer you this information and have you join us. Um, if I missed any questions, we'll scan through those and we'll follow up with you. I think we covered most of them. Um, please do consider supporting the Ecology Center. This is the end of the year and many of you are giving gifts to organizations that you support and care about. And so we hope that you will think of the Ecology Center in your end of year giving this year. Thank you already for many of you who have already supported our work. And we look forward to seeing you in the new year. We hope you have a healthy and happy holiday season. And we look forward to having more of these Ecology Center Live events in 2021. Thank you. Bye, thank you.